Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the second day of the conference. It's lovely to see the room so full and vibrant so early in the morning. Well, it's not that early, but first thing in the morning. Um, I hope you had a great evening, and for those who went to the exhibition, it was a really special night, so um, nice to see everybody again this morning. Um, we are now going to do a session of some reflection on yesterday before we go into the um, plenary for um, the morning that um, is going to be focused on um, men care and ECD. Um, so just before we go into the reflections, just a um, opportunity for some housekeeping. If there's any um, issues, questions about housekeeping, about the building, the conference venue, the, the, the space we're in, um, somebody left a mouse um, here yesterday. Um, so that is, is that yours? Okay. Um, you, I'm not going to make the terrible joke that it is easy to make. Um, okay, we're doing mousekeeping. So, so thanks, Chris. <laughs> so, um, any any other issues with the venue, etc. We will have a moment at the end of the plenary to um, to check in on the workshops and to make sure everybody knows exactly where each workshop is, and also what the workshops are about. Um, so I, I would encourage you in the meanwhile to, to please look at the program and think um, which workshop you're, you are likely to go to because we would want to see a show of hands of who is going to which workshop so we can allocate the room size accordingly. Um, then uh, let's open up for some thoughts about yesterday. Um, I have, uh, there's a microphone and Paul has got a microphone. Um, and any questions that remain, any thoughts that you were struck by? Um, we were quite tight on time. I th there were quite a few moments where we felt the conversations could have gone on longer, especially in the World Cafe session and some of the, um, the more fuller workshops. Um, the conversation could have continued. So now is an opportunity to actually raise something that you felt still needed to be said or a question you still had. Um, Please, the, the floor is open for a few minutes. And we can, we can also engage in, in some conversation on, on, on a point that anybody raises. Yes, Eberhardt? Thank you. I'm Eberhard from Berlin, Germany, and I just wanted to sh uh, share one or two thoughts about the issue of pa paid or unpaid care work that we were discussing. Uh, so th this thought goes like this. Um, in Germany and other Middle European and Northern European uh, countries, and elsewhere, which I don't know, uh, the, c the care issue is going in a way that uh, care is more and more, w which used to be unpaid work, it's, much, it's more and more transferred into paid work. Uh, some call it even the care revolution. Uh, th this has to do, for example, with early childhood education, which has been institutionalized and, and professionalized and which, is now, which has been moved out of the whole household and family uh, um, environment, but put into the institutional uh, environment and then is seen as professional and paid work. Uh, same happens with the elderly people. We have aging societies and uh, care work with elderly people is more and more professionalized and, pay and goes to, towards paid work instead of having elderly people cared for in the households. Then, moreover, uh, in, the, in the social security system, we have uh, more and more um, paid, paid payback, so to speak, in pensions or in uh, acknowledgments for, for raising children in, in the pension system. Mm -hmm. So when I thought about the, the issue of um, having more men in the households um, uh, uh, taking care of unpaid work, 
I was thinking, um, are we going to fall back into something that is overcome or that is on the edge of being overcome? Uh, because, well, it is, it is professionalized and paid now and we get, a, we get acknowledgement and, and pay back maybe when we are old or w when, uh, so th this is only that I wanted to share here. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, that's a very interesting question. So as the state takes um, responsibility for care that is paid, um, yeah, th there's of course the gender question of who is doing the care work in the institutions. Yes, please, Rachel. Um, so colleagues, maybe one or two short points, not to have too much of a long discussion. <laughs> yes, please, Rachel. Yes, my I'm name clear. is uh, Rachel Plum from the Netherlands, and I'd like to follow up on that comment because Yes, that, that's happening, eh, the professionalization of care. But still, it's, eh, as you say, Wessel, a very much a gender issue. Yeah. Uh, if you look in, into these sectors, it's still women working in these sectors. So there is still a very conflictive relationship with, with caring masculinity, not only in terms of fatherhood, but also very much in these sectors. And I think that's an interesting um, thought or need for further strategic dis uh, discussion, how can we link these areas uh, uh, for the sake of promotion of caring masculinities, not only in terms of fatherhood, but very much also in uh, caring uh, jobs, uh, boys and care and education. Um, and I think that's, that's also for me a very interesting strategic question for the men care movement. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, about what you just said uh, about caring and externalizing the care, um, there is indeed uh, a tipping point. But one thing that's scaring me is that caring and educating can be and should be at least partly exter externalized. But there is the nurturing part. And the nurturing part cannot be externalized. And that can be in at some point, but the ideal it's that it's performed by the parents. And that's where the gender uh, uh, thing is, is really uh, important because uh, nurturing is nurturing and the uh, parent cannot be replaced. It could be something could be put uh, for them, but I would like us to make the difference between the two. I think also um, we might hear a bit about it in the plenary that's to come, um, but some of you might be familiar with the nurturing care framework that very nicely maps out the different domains of nurturing care. Please. Good morning, Zuman, I, and woman. I, I want to mention that in this region, and I specifically speak about Lebanon, the paid care is done by uh, migrant domestic workers. Pretty much every household has um, a person from Asia, from Africa, that is doing um, the care work uh, for children, for people with disability, house chores, and all of that, in exploitative um, situations, the kafala system, what we call. And nowadays, we have um, a care uh, being provided, or, or something that uh, refugee women do a lot in the region, because nobody wants to do this job, it's easy to exploit, um, uh, the women might be of low skills, so there is an intersectionality component there. It's not only women, but it's also refugee women, domestic uh, workers, migrant workers, all this dimension. Yeah, it's valuable to acknowledge the intersectionality. Um, and also, any thoughts about a particular session yesterday or a particular point that was made yesterday? that anybody has some, some feedback on or some comment on. Um, a, one question that came up for me in the, um, the uh, patriarchy panel was a question on, some of us are familiar with this um, framework of working with uh, gender exploitative programs, working with gender neutral, gender sensitive and gender transformative programs. Um, and the question of how can we work with those organizations that work with fathers who are not explicitly misogynist or sexist, but are perhaps gender neutral or gender specific. Um, and they, they, they have a mission that is benevolent, um, but from a feminist critique, it might be seen as benevolent sexism. 
but yet there is an opportunity there to collaborate because they don't necessarily have an explicit men's rights agenda. So that's a question that I'm struggling with for men care for the last 12 years already is how do we work, can we work um, in collaboration with such, uh, I would say, uh, fence-sitting organizations that they might not go into the men's rights realm but might come rather towards gender equality as the evidence that we have shows. So that's a question that, that's still remaining for me. Any other thoughts from, from yesterday? Going? Yeah, Lillian, please. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to add that um, we need to also realize that our patriarchy is very much rooted in culture. And for those of us who have um, cultural leaders in our societies, they are the first go-to people in the communities. And to um, undo a culture is very, very difficult back home. We are trying this ongoing um, effort, but as we discuss even in the session that we'll have today where I, I saw something to do with our religious leaders, I think we need to also focus on the cultural leaders. I know that our constitutions are provide for, um, you know, they speak to repugnant culture, but even in the presence of the constitutions, we still have a lot of, um, you know, um, patriarchy that is uh, rooted in that. So I just thought that we should bring that out as we discuss. Thank you. Okay, last opportunity. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh, Suleiman. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Or maybe just good morning. Um, one of the things that stood out for me yesterday... Thank you, Mpo. Um, one of the things that stood out really was the Men Care for the Climate workshop. I mean, I think in particular because I have a two-month-old baby at home and I just came from a 25-hour flight. And it really, it, one of the things that, that it looked at was um, still having the, well, um, fixing the need for human interaction but not having to travel all the way across the world, especially with the amount of travel that we do in the development um, sector. Um, and then just being, being mindful of, in my care for my family, being mindful towards the care for the environment as well. Um, and that really stood out from where we shop to where we buy, to how we use water and all those type of things. So that was a highlight. Thank you. Thanks, Suleiman. It was, we had a dedicated message from Greta Thunberg for this conference, and that was really nice to, to hear. There were also a few other Fridays for Future leaders from around the world, from Uganda and Sweden and from Russia, actually. Um, so it was a very, a very interesting session. That also reminds me, in the um, sustainable food um, sector, a lot of times they had the phrase, think global, act local. And I think that's also something important for men care to think. Think global, act local. Okay. Um, since we're going to have a moment to talk about the workshops at the end of the plenary, let's go into the plenary early. Um, so over to you, Nikki. It's actually over to Sam because he's in charge of this one. So um, would you like to, all panellists, would you like to come and sit in your comfortable chairs? <laughs> While the panelists are joining us up front, good morning, everyone. Oh, la, la. Oh, ça va être difficile. Sabah el khair? Okay. Bonjour. Ah, voila. We're getting awake. We're having our coffee. We've all had breakfast. Good. It's great to, to, to hear the energy in the room. So, uh, I'm very pleased to be the facilitator for this plenary. Uh, the plenary is on fathers and male caregivers' involvement in early years. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's an early childhood development frame for the discussion around fatherhood. Um, a quick outline of the session, I'm going to introduce a little bit um, uh, the, the organization that I work for. I'm going to have a few questions um, with the panelists. The panelists are going to share very briefly about the work that they're doing. 
um, and then we're going to throw it open to you. And one of the feedbacks we got from the panels yesterday was that people wanted more time for Q&A with the panelists. And so we will do our best to um, have as much time as possible for the questions and answers. One thing I would like to request of all of you, s'il vous plaît, when you come with a question, it would be great if it sounds like a question. So it should end with a question mark, point d'interrogation. And ideally, um, I would really appreciate it if you could, um, as you're thinking about the question, find a way to formulate it that takes less than a minute or two. So we don't want to have six, seven minute long questions. Um, because we want to have time to have several rounds of questions going back and forth, right? So, um, so I, I plead for that a little bit in advance. Okay, so um, I didn't even introduce myself. My name is Sam, um, and I work with the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. A little bit about the foundation. I, many of you may not know us because we're an early childhood development-focused foundation. So we believe that all babies and toddlers especially the most vulnerable, um, should uh, have deserve a good start in life. Um, that's basically our, our mission. Um, and we believe that if that happens, that means that at an individual level, they will flourish and develop to their full potential. And that at a societal level, that leads to peaceful, creative, healthy societies. So I think someone, one of the speakers yesterday said it really well, uh, in terms of the nurturing care framework, yes, if we change the beginning of the story, we change the whole story. So we really believe the science, the evidence suggests that if you invest in what we call the first three years, actually you can even start before the kid is born, that that really makes a big impact. So we work in Brazil, India, Israel, Ivory Coast, Netherlands, Peru, Turkey, uh, and uh, we have a Syrian um, uh, crisis response program as well, which I think is, is actually similar to this, um, this uh, fatherhood movement as well, the men care movement in working in both uh, quote-unquote wealthier countries and middle income and lower uh, income countries. And I think it's, for me, that's one of the great things about these types of groups is the opportunities for cross-learning. Um, what do we do? Um, so early childhood development is a pretty broad sector. It could be pre-primary education, maternal and child health is part of early childhood development. So our foundation being a small Dutch-based foundation, um, we're really focused on, I guess, trying to figure out, well, there, there are two things. The first thing we noticed is that the, in the early childhood space, there are a lot of small, beautiful pilot programs, including work that we ourselves have funded for the last 50 years. And what we noticed is that there are not as many programs that scale up to the national level. Um, so one of the things we're really focused on and thinking about is how do we scale up? And I think that's also a relevant and interesting question for us when we think about fatherhood programming and fatherhood initiatives as well. Um, very specifically, we're working kind of in two spaces. We said, you know, maternal and child health, there are lots of other people working on that, so that's not going to be our focus, nutrition, some of these other sectors. So we have um, one initiative called Urban 95. 95 centimeters is the average height of a three-year-old, if you look around the world. Um, so we say, why don't you look at the city from this height? See, you can't even see me when I do that. And what does the city look like when you look at it from that perspective? How can we make cities, which is where the vast majority of humanity is, is already living and going to live, friendlier for the smallest children and their caregivers, moms and dads? Um, and then the second thing that we're focused on is parenting. And that's perhaps the most direct link, I think, here. Uh, so we've been supporting parenting programs. And our approach there has really been to say, how can we build parenting programs into larger social programs that are already reaching millions and millions of people so that we can get them to scale up? So that's kind of our strategy in the parenting space. Um, how do we combine parenting with health programs or with social insurance programs 
or uh, work-related, uh, labor force-related programs so that we can reach scale. So uh, based on what I've just said, you can understand why fatherhood is cr critical to us, especially with that parenting lens, and why I'm so pleased to be uh, facilitating this panel. We've got a great panel assembled for you. And before I even introduce them, before you know who they are, I'm going to ask each of them to tell us, um, and you can go in any order, but I'd be curious, what's been the biggest surprise of your career working on fatherhood issues? So it could be either something you believed firmly was true and then you found out it wasn't true, or it could be a program that you were sure would succeed or would fail and the opposite happened. I don't know what, but I would love to hear from each of you your biggest surprise so far in your career with fatherhood. And you know what, we'll just start with Duncan since he's right next to me. Excellent, me first. Okay, so um, my biggest surprise, the thing I'm most excited about in the world um, is we all know um, that babies' brains are formed around the relationship with the parent. That's a fundamental finding of early child development. Um, the biggest surprise to me was to discover that my brain was also changing completely and that I was becoming part of, or my child was becoming part of my head, was part of me. And that the fact that it's reciprocal explained so much to me about what it felt like and is like to be a loving father who's caring for your child. And that part of the research is not so much told. Uh, that part of it. So that was, for me, it's the, one of the most exciting things. Thank you. My name is Emmanuel Karamaje. I'm working for Rwanda Men's Resource Center in, in, located in Rwanda. My surprise is that men can change and become a caring father. Thank you very much. My name is Ashamsi Kazimbaya. I work for Promundo, but based in Kigali and collaborating with Rombrek. So my biggest surprise in this work, actually it's gonna be directly with fatherhood, but actually it's a component because when we've been implementing this in Rwanda, we had also the component of violence prevention. And what I've seen or what have surprised me, as opposed to what is actually known in African and specifically Rwandan culture, whereby the man is defined as the strongest, the powerful person in the family, but I noticed or I realized that actually men also were suffering in silence. Men were also victims of violence until we came up with this program that gave men safe space to talk about the experiences and I realized that actually men were also suffering from violence. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alyosha. I'm from International Step-by-Step -Step Association. And before I was working as a preschool teacher with children from age 11 months to six years old. And my biggest surprise uh, is based on an image that I had from my early childhood experience. My father was present, but not involved and engaged enough. So I also thought that fathers in preschool are not willing to cooperate and not willing to be involved, but my surprise was that if you give them space and time, they are willing to participate and they are really good, uh, good, uh, uh, good partners uh, in this process. So that was my uh, biggest surprise. I'm Maureen Sams Vaughan. I'm a researcher from Jamaica, and I do research at the University of the West Indies. So I'm coming from a research perspective, and my biggest surprise was the very high levels of engagement that Jamaican fathers had with their very young children. And this came from speaking with fathers, something that we hadn't done in the kind of depth that we did, and also talking to mothers about their engagement. It was really surprising how close the mother's perception and the father's reports were based on what you hear in the, in the community. One would never have thought that that would have been so close. Uh, good morning, my name is Saif for the Plan International Canada. Um, 
surprise. My biggest surprise was or what I thought that engaging men in an immersive gender discussion, ha, uh, many of them would be interested in the real issues, quote unquote, which are most, for example, livelihood, agriculture techniques, or financial things. Um, so which are sort of more manly things as opposed to talking about getting men engaged in gender. So I thought maybe it will get some limited traction. But while sort of working on this plan program uh, on, on show, Strengthening Women, Health uh, and Children, um, jointly with Pramando and, of course, Global Affairs Canada, uh, what, we, what I realized that I proved my thought proved like wrong, and you know, it, it proved otherwise. Given that there is, as some, many of the colleagues have also mentioned, if there is sort of supportive or environment is there, or enabling quote-unquote environment is there, men are willing to open up and discuss, and many of them are brave enough to even um, adopt positive masculinities. So to me, the surprise which we see in this multi-year, multi-country program, the way men across different countries have responded to it was a biggest surprise. Great, thank you. I like the range of different surprises that we've, that we've heard there. And maybe I can just share one of my own. Um, I was uh, earlier this year in Recife in Brazil, and we work uh, with a number of partners there. And we had um, some of our NGO partners were saying, we really need to work on father involvement in the favelas, in the, the, the difficult neighborhoods, right? They said the fathers are absent. They're not there. There's so much violence. This is gang violence as well as domestic violence. Um, and they said, you know, fathers, it's if you know, if you're a young gang member in the favela, you don't spend time with babies. That's totally uncool. And so we were talking about that. We said, you know, maybe we should start with play, early childhood development, fatherhood role. One of the positive practices we think let's promote play. So um, luckily for us, we were smart enough to say, let's do a little bit of formative research first. So we went out and um, talked to some fathers and observed some public spaces and stuff. And guess what? It turns out that fathers in favelas in Recife love to play with babies. It's amazing. You go out on the streets on a Sunday morning, you see young, tough dads with their little babies playing. And when we talked to the moms, they said, oh, please, whatever you do, no more brinca. The dads are already playing with the babies. It's just that they won't do anything else. A dad in that culture plays with a baby, but he doesn't change the diaper. He doesn't help with feeding. He doesn't, you know, it's only about play. So dad gets to do the fun stuff. And we as moms would really like dads to start doing some of the other things. So for me, I think that was a nice surprise that even when we talk about father's involvement, well, what does that mean? And are we really, do we know enough about the specific situation to know what's the gap? Because I think we all come with certain assumptions about the way fathers are or aren't. And it's, it's really interesting. So I'm going to go really quickly um, and invite each of the panel members to maybe give a, just about five minutes to talk a little bit about your work on fatherhood and early childhood development. And maybe we can start with, with Maureen, actually. Um, I think you know, you, you've done a lot of really interesting work and were involved in leading the first kind of cross-sectoral uh, national strategic plan for ECD in Jamaica. So it would be great to hear about that and particularly with regards to the role that you see in terms of fatherhood and prevention of uh, gender-based violence and violence against women. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, my role as the, so I, I mentioned my research role. I was seconded from the university to develop Jamaica's Early Childhood Commission, which is responsible for early childhood development in Jamaica, shaping policy. And one of the first things we decided was that in that strategic plan that we developed, that parenting was going to be a first pillar. Once we got into parenting, we realized that it was important to develop a national parenting policy. And we ensured that fathers were critical to this policy. But 
uh, sorry, the policy made sure that the government of Jamaica stated very clearly its focus on improving parenting support. I'm not saying we're perfect, but this was important. Um, the importance to Jamaica is a country that has high levels of violence. And working with fathers to reduce violence against children is an untapped area of focus. Uh, just recently, past June, we focused on the latest research and noteworthy practices from around the world in the field of fathers and male caregivers involvement and gender equity programs and policies. Uh, we organized a pre-conference workshop in Leiden, uh, in the Netherlands, where International Step-by-Step -Step Association is based. Uh, and during a recent thematic meeting uh, that we organized for our members, partners, friends of ISA, and potential donors in Ljubljana, we were very happy to partner with Promundo, with Tatiana. Is she in the room? Yes, there. So we organized uh, together with Promundo a workshop um, focusing on uh, how to engage men in caregiving and gender equality. Our members also shared some experiences uh, in table discussions and focusing more in, um, on the topic of overcoming the mother-centric approaches uh, in family engagement and support and fostering father's engagement. And then one important thing is also that we, we have in ISA are peer learning activities when our members, we have around 100 uh, member organizations, um, can share their experiences, good practices, programs, initiatives, etc. And we have organizations that are focusing on father support programs, as Achev does from Turkey, and some, some members from uh, Kosovo, uh, Kosovo Education Center, they are focusing on father's club and father's engagement in this way. So, and we are actually planning to have more peer learning activities that members can learn from each other in the next year on this topic. So, I think... Great, great. That's Thank exciting you. to hear that it's a topic that within the ECD world is, is gaining traction and that even ISA is, is planning to intensify peer learning around that. I want to pick up on, on something that you said and, and bring it, I think, uh, uh, to SAFE because you talked about overcoming the mother-centric approach. I think traditionally in the early childhood world, um, there has been a natural natural, I shouldn't say natural, there's been a very understandable focus on mom's maternal health uh, because of health, nutrition, many of these programs. And I think it would be really interesting to hear from you. I know that PLAN um, sort of recognized that a lot of your work in the past had been very focused on moms and that PLAN has been kind of making efforts to, to increase the focus on, on fathers and developing some guidance. So it would be great to hear from you, your perspective on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, indeed, the Plan International's work uh, on early year child focused child development programming uh, spans more than two decades, and the Plan has been sort of operational with these programming in different sort of region uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Caribbean. Um, and recently, that what we are focusing with this program to make it more um, transitioning it to align with uh, the nurturing and care framework. Um, also, uh, the fact that we we have uh, with the Plan International's focus on you know child rights and gender equality in all of our thematic areas. So we are also making you know a deliberate and concerted effort to get men engaged in early child development programming across all these regions. So how this shift has really happened as you sort of asked this question. Um, in 2012 and 17, uh, sorry, 2012 and 15, uh, PLAN carried out an assessment, gender assessment of its program in 17 countries. The idea was to see what 
we are doing in that and, uh, and how does, for example, um, the gender issues are uh, captured in that. And what we found four things. One was that in these target 17 countries we were pro programming, the role of women was basically, uh, as you mentioned, understandably, if not naturally, was much more their role as wives and playing, uh, nurturing children and taking care of children. And they are the prime responsible to take care of that child need and development. And in these countries also, across these different cultures, the role of men was, of course, the breadwinner. And he's the one who is sort of accountable to bring at that you know, money and resources to the family and has this uh, disproportionate um, position in decision making. Um, and then we looked at uh, the role of teachers, parents, and the caregivers around children and then child uh, early development prog programming. Uh, and these three stakeholders, in their view, uh, about boys and girls was typical, stereotypical roles of boys and, and girls. And that's what they want them to see in the future roles in these societies. So where boys are going to grow up and do play their father's role in gender stereotypical sense, and girls going to grow up and play that meant, uh, mother's roles, nurturing and caring. And what we looked at in our own programming and that was also the learning for us, that our own programming was reflecting same gender roles as opposed to challenging the gender norms. And that was sort of a, you know, a learning for ourselves and how we need to uh, correct ourselves and, 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 and challenge that gender norms. So, so that's where uh, this, this shift sort of realizing it. So even the increased efforts which were made to sort of make these uh, men more engaged into uh, early child de and development programming. Uh, we More concerted efforts were made, for example, to invite those men into those groups where women were also present to have this, um, to ensure that men get engaged in those uh, discussion. And we did, to be honest, that we did find some success in some of the regions, in some of the countries. For example, in Indonesia, Nicaragua, uh, Uganda, Kenya, where we did see there's some uh, increase happen in terms of men participating into those discussion, yeah? Uh, but not really, again, there was the issue of attrition, so that, or they are not uh, so much interested in that, and then dropout would happen, and that was really interesting, that what we're gonna do that. And that's where the plan, International Canada's program show, uh, Strengthening Women um, Health and Children, uh, came into play and that learning which we have of men engagement strategies, which we jointly developed with Pramando, as I mentioned earlier also, helped us to come up with men-focused strategies to initiate uh, the process at a much more immersive level of a conversation with those men in target community to engage them in this situation. There are several other things also, but I guess in the interest of time, yes. Um, and I'll wind up from here and pass it on to you. Great, thank you. That's really interesting. And I, I really appreciate your willingness to be self-critical and to share about your own uh, plans own institutional kind of journey of, of moving towards a greater focus on, on fatherhood. Um, Duncan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to you. You've been working in this space for a, a long time. You've seen many things come and go. Just be curious to get your, if you can share a little bit about what you do and then your kind of view of where we are and, and what, what are some of the critical things we should be moving towards. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I got into this field 20 years ago when my first daughter was, our first daughter was born. Uh, this is actually my first international conference on fatherhood since the last one I went to, which was exactly 20 years ago this year. And the only person that was there that is Gary. So that was, and that was the last time I was at an international conference with Gary. Um, I have immersed myself, I've, I've founded the Fatherhood Institute in the UK and immersed myself in the research. And it, it was a fantastic experience while raising my children to read the research about what was happening to me and to the children. It's been a very affirming experience. Now I publish two, two uh, websites, which I do urge you to look at and subscribe. All the new content gets emailed to subscribers. The Child and Family blog is an early child development, child development website, which is with Cambridge and Princeton universities. Um, uh, and family included is, is a sort of voluntary thing myself. I report on every piece of new research on 
maternal and newborn health and fathers and families. So there are about 400 reports since 2015. Do, do look at that and, and search for your own country, right? Because I bet you there are things there that you didn't know about because publications, no one reads them. Um, and on the Child and Family blog, just a couple of things, observations about yesterday. Uh, two things that are just being reported at the moment a lot. One is how do children learn gender stereotypes? And I was thinking about it yesterday. I didn't say anything because it's a child development issue. If you tell a four-and-a-half-year-old that boys are good at making pizzas, they will believe that girls are not good at making pizzas. Right? You don't have to mention girls. You just have to say the same. So there's a whole load of research around how they do that. Another big topic right now is how do children learn in different cultures? In some cultures, they ask lots and lots of why, 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 why questions. In other cultures, they learn by imitation, by watching adults do things. And these are different learning styles, but the same outcomes. The challenge in early years is that men are less available than they are around the birth. They're working, mainly. It's difficult to get them. And over 20 years of observing early year services, services for fathers are very vulnerable to stopping. They're, very, um, uh, they're not stable. There's one exception in this room, Eberhardt from Germany. He has the longest running fatherhood program, I think, in the world. I don't know. It's unbelievable, but he's been going for longer than I've been around. Um, but I think things are going to get worse. 80% of the damage of climate change is going to happen to children in the next 30 years. And we're going to start focusing on how to keep them alive more and more and more, not on child development. So I think things are going to get it tough. But there is a huge interest in fathers online. I do recommend this post that I made. It's 11 viral videos online on fatherhood with 0.4 billion views between them. It's big, right? People are talking about this stuff online. They're lovely videos, by the way. They'll make you cry. So be careful. So how do we operate in this really difficult environment? I think we need to embolden and encourage and support the advocates for change in all the communities around the world. There are fathers who are challenging gender norms and in in every community in the world, and often they are quite alone. So, so I want to work out how do we reach them and, and affirm them and, and give them strength. Uh, to, to, you know, they should not feel alone and they should have the evidence. And the last thing, um, I think we need to do a lot more to represent the fatherhood issue in the global process of early child development, in the nurturing care strategy. It's a big weakness at the moment. The, the issue is simply not held by anyone or represented by anyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks for those, those uh, reflections and for sharing these resources. We'll, we'll, we'll decide when to watch the videos, when it's okay for us to cry. Um, I, maybe... Um, I'd like to touch upon one of the things that you said and then, and then bring it to Rwanda. So um, I think it's interesting to think about the bottom-up approach. And I really liked what you said about finding the fathers who are already champions in their own way within the various different communities that we're looking at and giving them support and giving them voice to be champions or role models or coaches or mentors or whatever or advocates um, for policy change. So... I really like um, that thought about bottom-up approaches. But I'd also like to come back to a little bit about what Maureen was saying about the importance of national government policy and, and a little bit your last point about saying we need to see this anchored more deeply in, in kind of the international dialogues and at the formal level. And I think one of the interesting things about the work that Promundo and Ramwek have been doing in Rwanda has been that strong engagement with the government there um, and really trying to make it not just an NGO, say, project, but really engaging with government as well. So kind of the complementarity of bottom-up and top-down approaches. So maybe you could share a little bit, uh, the two of you, about the work that you guys have sure. been doing. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to share a little bit about the background of the program itself in Rwanda, and then I'll pass on to Emmanuel to share where we are today 
with our work with the government and trying to scale up the program. So in Rwanda, what we did, we implemented the Men Care Plus program, which is part of the global Men Care campaign. And this was a four countries initiative. Mainly, I mean, it was Rwanda, Brazil, South Africa, and Indonesia. And it was a three years project aiming at engaging fathers or men as caregivers and partners in maternal, newborn, and child health, but also sexual reproductive health and rights, and also preventing gender-based violence. This project was implemented together with Romrec, of course, as a partner in Rwanda, but also with the government through the Ministry of Health. So what we did, we adapted the program B based on the formative research that we conducted in the very beginning of the program, and it was based on the findings of the, the, the formative research that we adapted the program B in Rwanda. Uh, so the program was run through gender transformative group education, as we do with the program B and other programs like program H. And what we did for the program B or the group education with the fathers and the couples, we did a randomized control trial at the end of the program. Actually, we collected data at different times. First, after the first data collection was done after three, after nine months of the implementation. We then go back and collect data again after 15 months. And finally, the result we are having from the RRCT are from the third round of data collection. And this was after 21 months. So I'm just going to highlight very briefly some impressive results or findings that we saw from the RRCT. And that interested the government actually to be willing to scale up the program. So what we have seen from the program is that there was, a, it was, there was an increased men's engagement in the lives of their children, and also the way they've been interacting with the children in the more... This was Musanze district, and we decided to implement the Bandevere program in 16 health centers using, uh, 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 using 409 community health workers. And we are targeting now expectant, expectant fathers, couples with under five children, selected by community health workers in collaboration with the local leaders. And they meet on weekly basis, and some sessions are for men only, others combine men and women, and all those sessions for group education are run by community health workers supported by health centers and district leaders with technical support from Rwamrik and Promondo. And therefore, we realize that the government of Rwanda is much interested in owning this program because it is responding to some issues related to unpaid care work and area childhood development. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that I'm standing up here with the microphone to, to ask one question um, to put it to the panel and then as soon as um, some of them or all of them have answered my question, I'm gonna turn it over to the audience uh, so uh, for your questions as well. So uh, yeah, I had so many questions I wanted to ask you guys. I guess, um, I think, I'm gonna try and combine all of my questions into one. It's a very clever strategy to do. Um, I think the question I'd like to ask is about, is, is drawing on the point that was just made about evidence and scaling up. So I think what I'd like to hear from you, from each of you, from your own perspective is, you know, how can we generate more evidence about the impact of fatherhood programs uh, on early childhood development in order to build support for by national governments, by UN agencies, by other actors, by donors and funders, so that we start moving away. I think the, 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 the example from Rwanda is great, moving away from, from NGO projects into full-fledged uh, government programs or policy change as we heard about in, in, in Jamaica would be really interesting to hear what was the type of evidence that you marshaled to, to drive some of that policy change. Um, and I think for me, part of that question is also about 
what are we measuring? Are we measuring changes in attitudes and knowledge? Are we measuring changes in specific fatherhood behaviors? So I'm just curious from all of your experience and perspective, what are some good practices or how should we be thinking about generating or marshalling that evidence to really translate into either policy change or, 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 or scaling up programs at the high level. And maybe, um, yeah, I'll just open it up for whoever wants to take a shot at uh, answering. Um, okay, can start with you. Okay, I think there are, uh, f first of all, can I say that from where I sit, reading the research and looking at what's going on in the world, Rwanda stands out. Um, for two reasons. One, that it's the, the men care research is the first research to show uh, outcomes in relation to violence. Right? No, one, no one else has tried that. So that was, that's first. That was striking. And secondly, the fact that you're scaling it up, which is incredibly unusual and, and very powerful. So um, it's just I wanted to say that because I think it's fantastic. Uh, I think there are four outcomes that we need to look for. Um, the first one is maternal and newborn health, breastfeeding, um, the mother's health. Uh, we have a great expert here, Liz, from Australia, who leads on that. Um, and uh, so that's the first. The second one is child development outcomes, uh, uh, cognitive development, social and emotional development. Looking at that in the first months and years, we need to do that. And the first research showing outcomes in both of those areas has just been published from Vietnam, where, where you're getting both those sets of outcomes. Third one is family relationships or the couple relationship. Again, Liz, you, you've just published stuff exactly on that. Unexpectedly finding that when you work with fathers, the families report more love. And we, she actually, you actually use that word in your research, that it creates love. And we need to measure that. And the fourth one is the violence, uh, gender equality, behavior change. And I think we need to measure all of them. Can I just, a word of warning though, my experience is it doesn't matter how much evidence you produce, getting it to be scaled up and implemented is not automatic. If we think, oh, just produce the evidence and then it'll happen, it will not happen. It will happen, it's happening in Rwanda because you've got brilliant advocates who are hammering away day and night to make it happen, right? It's very difficult to move from the research base to implementation. No, I think it's a very interesting question that what we are looking at and what is the evidence and very aptly put by our colleague panel member. Um, and I just want to share the example um, from the show project which Plan International uh, is, is implementing, Plan Canada, in, in different countries. We are at a stage of this multi-year, multi-country program where the, our end line results coming up. We already have uh, two data evidences available on the midterm of the program intervention and also the Fathers Club intervention which we made in across these countries, about more than 1,000 Fathers Club were established and, and they went through this whole uh, uh, curriculum learning. So what we are looking at is the, the effect of, measuring the effect of that engaging fathers in the MNCH discussion, in the MNCH process or, or the, uh, what we say, uh, typically we talk about the continuum of care, getting men engaged in that. Does it produce a positive outcome in terms of women getting better health care or actually accessing health care? Are men are part of that process? Does this male engagement lead to that result? We have already seen uh, that, uh, the evidence. And, and my colleague Tahina, who actually uh, managed this project for many, many years, is, uh, and jointly both of us are presenting uh, in a post-lunch session, a workshop on the effect of Father's Club, what empty our midterm data talked about, and what our quality of data talked about, the effects of investing on men to promote positive masculinity, to ensure they are engaged in the, uh, within their family discussion. There is less violence or no violence. There is uh, more uh, sense of responsibility. So that data, both quantitative and qualitative data, we would like to share in that way. So I think that's very important to see what we are measuring. It's important unless we cannot talk about that where it goes. And uh, as mentioned very rightly, if the data is there and we don't take it forward, it's not going to go anywhere. So in our discussion with WHO, 
for example, under their nursing care framework, what we are discussing is, is providing them more technical information that how in the early child development program, where the government agency which will get engaged is not the education, it's the health ministry. How, for example, their community extension worker or um, health facility-based worker could be engaged and given some guidance, or tools, or trainings to ensure that men are engaged in that process. So that discussion is happening. And some of the countries where we are working, we're also taking it up to the policy level because the Ministry of Health in those countries were part of this whole process of show program implementation. First, I'm gonna begin, as I always do, with the, with the research. Um, there are so many countries that we have absolutely no research on what fathers think and how fathers feel. And part of this is because just generic research uh, on child development often focuses on mothers because they're easy to access, um, because in some countries it's just believed that the children are still the remit of mothers. But when we actually focus our research on fathers, we learn completely different things. And what this does is if we focus research on fathers, it allows us to one, focus our programs better, two, it allows us to advocate better at the policy level, and it allows us to change our training programs. And I'm talking not about, I'm talking about training programs for teachers, for healthcare workers, for social sector workers. You know, we have this feeling that, for example, social sector workers know about fathers. Absolutely not. It's, it's a huge deficiency. And it's really important for countries to focus on their own research because you're going to find the cultural differences that are important. Then it's important to use research to move to policy. And researchers, have to get into programs. Researchers have to provide information, which means that every time somebody calls you to go on a radio program, you go. Yeah? I, I don't know what happens in other countries, but 10 minutes before a program, they call you, can you talk about this? Go. Because if you don't go, somebody else is going to go who doesn't have the correct information. So it makes sense that you go. And this is not just for researchers, but it's also for persons engaged in programs. Make yourself the authority in the country by getting the public on board with you. And th this is why you need the media. So you always go with the media. Also, make, your, make sure that you put yourself on, uh, you agree to serve on government boards, on all the government institutions. The government, you know, boards are all over in every country. Make sure you go, because then that's how you have a voice, and that's how you get into policy. You can't get into policy by sitting quietly by yourself. You have to have that space. And in order to go there, you also need the evidence to drive it. And so I, I come, from the, uh, come from the background where I was a researcher that was able to get into policy, and this was very, very, a, a very interesting dimension for me. But it also taught me how to actually make sustainable change. I heard lots of, lots of discussions about sustainability, and you, you mentioned Duncan, a program that was able to um, continue for many, many years. But getting into policy allows from policy then to have legislation made. And that's how you get things sustainable, and that's how you make sure things change, things stay the same, even when there's a change of government. So you have to move out of your comfort zone and get into the places where you can make real, lasting change. Okay, maybe I can just add, because a lot of us already mentioned, is when we are planning programs and initiatives or actions, we should involve fathers not just in, impl in implementation, but also in planning and designing, implementation, and then also in evaluation. So, so involving them from, from the outset throughout the program cycle. Yep. But 
thank you. Maybe uh, one of our strengths during the implementation of Medicare uh, Plus program was involvement with of the government of Rwanda from the planning and the design, implementation, and the dealing, monitoring, and evaluation process. But also, we try to be aligned with the government policy toward the maternal child health, family planning policies, gender-based violence, gender policies, but also involvement of media and the local leaders at the grassroots level uh, was one of the strengths to make sure that the, the sustainability is possible where everyone is involved from top to down. And then all those leaders and the stakeholders were involved from the starting point up to evaluation and during and even after the the findings of Ara City, we shared the result with the government from high level leaders up to grassroots level leaders. This means the achievement is not only for Rwamrek and Promondo, but also it is it was a joint effort between the government of Rwanda, a national level district level and even the community level, it was the joint effort to achieve all those success. Before maybe uh, looking at the scientific evidence, we need to convince our leaders, our community members, what have been done and what is the impact and the importance of involvement of men in all those programs related to maternal and maternal health in the ECD program and unpaid care work. Thank you. Great. All right. A really interesting set of answers there. You know, one thing that strikes me is it was interesting to hear how much the discussion was still about health. Um, and it seems like, you know, health is a priority of governments. There's funding there. There's an openness there. So it was really interesting to hear, you know, most of the discussion was about health, ministries of health. There was some discussion of child development, but nobody said the minister, Ministry of Education is our strong ally. It was, it, I'm just reflecting on that from the early childhood perspective. You might think, oh, education, childhood education. That didn't come out so much. And I also didn't hear, I mean, I, you know, this issue of gender-based violence, also came up, but also sounded like from the health lens that that was kind of the way it, it, it often gets uh, policy traction. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just interesting to reflect on when we think about fatherhood and with our own early childhood development lens, what are the paths that are open? What are the opportunities? Uh, where are the places that we can get traction? Where is there funding? And what are some of the areas where, you know, maybe we haven't been as as successful. Um, and it's interesting to me that the word paternity leave also didn't come up in this particular panel so far. So that kind of work, uh, the, the work um, uh, livelihoods angle didn't come up so strongly. Um, so just, you know, kind of interesting to think about. So I'm going to uh, open it up to the floor now. I think what we're going to do is ask for maybe two or three questions, then we'll come back to the panel and then we'll go back for more questions. Um, and again, please, my request is if we can keep the questions uh, short and in the form of a question, that would be wonderful. Um, and feel free to ask either a question for everybody on the panel or specific questions to specific people is fine as well. Um, Good morning, um, Daniel from Brazil, from Promundo Brazil. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentations. Uh, lots of very interesting ideas and, and thanks um, overall. Um, my, my question is, uh, we're living in a situation right now, not only in Brazil, but in many other countries, where uh, a very, very uh, rigid uh, neoliberal policies are being implemented and you have across the border, uh, uh, governments trying to destroy workers' rights, and uh, you see the investment that goes to 
public health and public education going down in many places. You have public pension systems being attacked, like it just happened in Brazil. And, and at the same time, that goes hand to hand with uh, uh, policies or, or approaches by the government with a very strong backlash on gender equality and on women's rights. So my, my questions are, can children be happy when fathers and mothers are miserable? And can programs that are uh, 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 directed to early childhood development, governmental programs, actually work when every other policies around it are being destroyed? Okay, so that's it. Great, great question. Maybe we'll take another couple of questions and then... Could I just check where the other microphone is? There are a few microphones floating around. So the Mbo's got one, okay. Thank you. Well, I have two questions, uh, quick questions. The first is to Mr. Saifullah. You said that uh, male engagement means more access for women to health and health services. May, may you elaborate more? And also maybe I don't know the context that this applies to. The second question is to all the members. If I want to work at policy level and I want to advocate for a policy, what, and it, now it came only to my mind, the paternity leave. What else, what other ideas that at the policy level will ensure men engagement in the early childhood and uh, in the life of, his, of the children? So maybe we'll take one more question, then we'll open it to the panel, and then we'll go for, for more questions. Uh, over here. It's okay, you can use this one. I just, uh, sorry for my English, it's not very good, but uh, <laughs> I will do my best. Uh, just can you give us uh, some example uh, of a kind of practical example of experience to how to involve father, especially uh, you talk about uh, social workers. What kind of example have you, um, have you seen of how to involve social worker of changing the way the, of involving Father. Great. I think those are three great questions to start with, and then so let's let's uh, put them to the panel, and then we can go back for more questions. So just a quick uh, reminder: the first question was, you know, can ECG programs succeed when the broader policy environment in several countries is really harmful for 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 for, for the parents and caregivers? And I think there's even going to be a, a panel discussion or a session looking at some of this uh, neoliberal kind of backlash that, uh, 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 coming soon. Um, I think the second one was, there was a specific question for Seth, and then there was what besides paternity leave are some of the key policies that we would, you know, that we think are at the intersection of ECD and fatherhood. And then the third are, what are some really practical examples, good, good practices that you've seen in your programming that um, can help uh, social workers and others engage fathers and bring them into that conversation. Maybe we'll start with Seth uh, because there was that specific question and then we'll open it up. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll try to be brief and, and, and give some response to the question the lady asked, but then we have a workshop after the lunch and we can have a more detailed discussion. Uh, but quickly, when we look at the gender assessment carried out in these countries, what we found out there was a range of barriers which were um, limiting women um, uh, access to health services for maternity or MNC, for ANC visits or PNC or even for skilled birth attendance that way. And those, among those range of barriers, some of the barriers were where, for example, commuting was a challenge. For example, where the man was not giving a permission to, uh, to the wife to go to the health facility. Where they do not really understand that it is really important, critical for both wife and the child to have those visits at the health facility to benefit 
um, what government is already offering that. And there's a reliance on traditional practices because my mom says that, okay, that's all right. You can give birth at home and that's fine. Uh, why so you're so fragile or sensitive that you have to go and uh, to get all these six, seven visits with well, WHO promoting eight visits. So that sort of a stuff, those barriers were there, the commuting, the nutrition, for example. The fact that even you are pregnant and you're a workload and you know uh, the uh, domestic workload which you have is also constantly creating problem that way. So when we did this father's club intervention and engaged men in this whole immersive discussion which is reflective, which helped us and helped them to improve and, and sort of uh, overcome those barriers and remain much more strong, emotionally engaged with, this, with, their, with their families and their wives. And their, even the instrumentality somewhere earlier, for example, where the man was actually taking their wives to the health facility, it's like, okay, we take you, my wife to the health facility, drop her there, and then, okay, you talk to the doc, health professionals to where they're actually part of those discussion as, as supportive husband, not as somebody who's sort of taking this uh, away from that. So that's what we talk about. It helped us to over, overcome that. Quickly to the, to, to the point you, I think, asked about social worker. In these countries and in many other countries also, you have health workers, government health workers, who are either based in the health centers or in some places you also have health workers who go to the community and talk about MNCH issues, talk about, promote about, okay, if someone is pregnant, you need to come and visit and see a health professional to seek advice so that your health and health of child is there. So typically what they do is, is just actually go and talk, look at those women who are pregnant and talk to them. And what we are promoting through, the, through our work, that when you are going there, and if you go with a gender blind or gender sort of unaware sort of a lens, so I talk to the women that it's important the health visit, important the nutrition, important to go to the diet, fine. So my job as a health professional was to give this information, I've given that. I as a woman receiving this information, for example, like, okay, but I do not have permission to go to the health facility. I do not have, I cannot commute alone. I do not have money to buy nutritional food. I do not have the ability to say no to certain work because I have to do that, uh, whether it's a cooking, cleaning, you know, taking care of the other kids that way. So my ability to make those decisions is not there. So now that I have this information that it's important for me to go there, but I can't. So with the health facility extension worker, what we are uh, trained them is part of this work, which called, you know, uh, community health workers, and I'll complete my point here, is that uh, when you go there, also talk to the husbands, also talk to the mother-in-laws, also ensure that these are the people who are part of this ecosystem which creates that barrier, which creates that challenge. And if you want to change that, you need to use that. And that's where we are working with trying to work for the ECD also with WHO and health ministries, because that's where you can reach out to these uh, women and children. Thank you. Great. Anyone else want to jump in? Maybe Maureen and then Duncan and then... All right. I'm just going to address the question here. So it's, you, you mentioned training and support for community-based workers and in service training for all levels of workers who work with young children is important. I mentioned health, there's education, there's a social sector. In-service training is really critical but in-service training um, gets to that group of people that are receiving a training at one time. Where one needs to work as well is in curricula. We have to get into the curricula of educators, social workers, health professionals, meaning doctors, nurses, midwives, all the other health professionals. We have to get into the curricula to make sure that every group that's graduating understands the importance of fatherhood, the importance of parenting, and that's how we're going to get long-lasting change as well as the on-the-ground, consistent, um, persistent training of workers. In terms of the question regarding policy, um, apart from parental leave, it's important that we get into, that we try to look at some of the policies that we need, such as parental supporting policy. Not so much parental education, which is a part of parental support, but parental support policies are critical so that we can get parents the access to parenting support that they need. 
and to ensure that this parenting support is not mother-centric, that it addresses both mothers and fathers. And in some of the cultures in which we live and work, a, uh, a parent can also be the grandparent or the uncle or the aunt because we have multiple caregivers for children. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, on the right wing uh, thing, um, I hear your pain uh, from Brazil. So here's the pain back from Brexit Britain. Um, everything I built has been destroyed already in, in the UK. There's nothing left. The organization has gone. All the programs we set up have gone. It's all gone. So it's very, very painful. Um, and I think it, unhappy parents, is a problem for child development. Absolutely it is. And I think that we are creating a very bad situation. So we can talk about it. We can ha perhaps have a hug, a communal hug, just people from Britain and Brazil, yeah? Anyone from the United States who yeah. wants to join in, yeah? Or anywhere else for that matter. Um, in terms of other policies uh, too, uh, I think uh, getting into maternal and newborn health, if you don't reach the dads at that point, it's very difficult to catch up with them later. Yeah. So there is. It's not that you, you were talking about. You know, uh, the, the, you know, the slant. If you don't get in at that point, you won't get them. They, they've gone after that. So you have to get them then anyway. Um, and uh, as Maureen said, you've got to get into the policy making. My experience of 20 years of policy making, it's unbelievably slow. Um, you have to be like a ferret. You have to dig, 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 dig all the time. And then suddenly a door will open that's been closed for 15 years, and you suddenly. So, for, for example, me, um, the UK, the England, suddenly decided to revise the whole of the antenatal care standards for the health service, set up a committee, and I got myself onto it, which is more influence than I've ever had any in 15 years, right? But I didn't, I didn't even know it was going to happen. Um, the other thing in, 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 uh, you've mentioned in early years, engaging with what science, the, the research is called the community of care. It's no... It's no good just engaging with one parent. That's not how child development works. Children are in a community of care. They're surrounded by things. If you go for one parent, you're, you're just not, de you're not getting to the child properly. Um, social workers. Um, in the UK, social workers' role is mainly now to uh, rescue children when family care is breaking down. Is that what you were saying? Is that your definition of social workers? Uh, I am social worker. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. I hope it's not only that. No. Well, it, well, <laughs> in Brexit Britain it is. Um, no, but 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 I was at a, a, a conference of social workers uh, some years ago, and I, and I had one little story to share, which I can't illustrate it. They were dealing with a child who was being abused. Uh, uh, by uh, the child's mother. So they had to put the child somewhere else. So they looked at the resources. What are the resources for this child? And of course, the first thing they look at is grandparents. Okay? And that's what they did. They put the child with the grandparents. Except that the grandparents had abused the mother, which was why the mother was abusing the child, right? So it didn't actually, it got worse uh, because the child's with abusive parents. They, t they, they didn't consider the father because he didn't have a home and he didn't have a job, so he couldn't be. The light bulb moment for the social workers was to ask themselves the question, what if we help the father to become a carer and to have a home? Okay, and the moment they did that, they saw things in a different light. And actually in this story, the child then went to the father, who then had the help from social workers to have the right environment. But he had the capacity not to abuse the child. Um, so I think it's training. It's training. That's the, the issue. And there are, I'm sure, in your country, there are quite a lot of social workers who get that. And it's like getting them together and creating that sort of... That's how, that's how the social workers did it in the UK. They got together and started advocating a sort of change. Yeah, but social worker can be in the prevention also, not yeah. only in the emergency. Yeah. Well... It, yeah, and that, well, then that comes back into the sort of early years approach, which is the community of care. You have to see mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah, the, 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 
a group of carers. Children are raised by groups. Human parenting is a group activity. We're not chimpanzees where one person looks after the child. We're a group, and you need to work with the group. That's the thing, and that's training and uh, training and education of the profession. Maybe Alyosha and then... Okay, I will just add very briefly to, to your question about uh, concrete examples. Uh, it's not related to social workers, but it's more about health mediators and community workers in, uh, that are working in community with families. So a few years ago, we partnered, Edisa, we partnered with UNICEF and we developed the Supporting Families for Nurturing Care, a resource package to strengthen home visiting practices. And out of 18 modules, one focuses only on father engagement and fathers. So, uh, and these resources are accessible through our website and are online and in different languages as Arabic, Russian, Croatian, Georgian, Kazakh, Serbian, etc. So maybe you can visit our website and you will find beside this a lot of other materials as well. So. There was maybe one more or one more response, yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, I would like to talk about intersection between ECD and the fatherhood based on the practical experience. During the implementation of men care, we realized that there is a power imbalance between men and women, lack of decision making. And if a woman is looking for family planning services, for antenatal care services, for other uh, health services related, men who is not trained or who is not supported may break the, may say, no, don't go to the clinical services, don't take family planning services, or remove this method because of side effect. And this was the embarrassment between health care providers and the client because men was somehow invisible in the services. When after, uh, sorry, after the training of group of fathers, fathers become more supportive to the women on family planning, on antenatal, antenatal care services, in the other services related to maternal, newborn, and child health. And men who were supportive or were even involved from antenatal care service, they accompanied women on the services, they accompanied the women in the waiting room, delivery room, and even, even assist wives during the during the 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 river during the delivery room, that was for me one of the intersection between uh, early childhood and fatherhood. When a father is supportive, he support from the beginning during the pregnancy and after the pregnancy during the postpartum services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just very quickly regarding the question uh, about practical examples working with the social workers. So just to say, and also complementing what Emmanuel have just said, and from the round experience again, is that what it requires is that the social workers as well, or any other facilitators that are working with the fathers to involve them in ECD and all those programs, it requires at first that those social workers are also trained on gender transformative approaches. Because what I've seen in Rwanda as a challenge is, even though we've been having those fathers who have been transformed and changed and more supportive of their wives, once they decided to go to the health services, they were blocked by the providers. So then what we did in Rwanda, we also trained the health care providers, including the social workers and the others, because otherwise it has become like a conflict between the fathers, the men, who have become more gender sensitive, and then who were going to the services and were pushed back by the service providers. So, but by now I think we are doing well in that, in that area. And again, just to say that 
we should not assume that the so educated people are more gender sensitive because we have, de we have seen the, the, op the opposite of that. So I think having those you know, who are meant to provide service being trained is the first step to make sure the program is really effective. Thank you. Just before going for some more questions, a, a couple of things. Um, you know, one thing that, um, from the ECD perspective, I think we think a lot about the early childhood workforce. So who are the different workforces who work in early childhood development? How can we build them up? So maybe an interesting question here is, where is the fatherhood workforce? Who are they? I can tell you for sure that in developing countries, in sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, if we're gonna be relying on health workers, those home visitors who visit homes and stuff, guess what? 95% of them are women. So what opportunities or barriers does that face? And in certain cultures, the ability of a woman to sit with a group of men and talk about fatherhood issues is gonna be a challenge. So I think one question that we could think about, and it's a policy question as well, is who is the fatherhood workforce? Are they in health? Are they in education? Are they in social work? Are they ready? Let's say we want to scale up tomorrow. Do we have the workforce in place who can work on fatherhood issues? I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, one thing that we've seen in our work um, on fatherhood in parenting is that a lot of social workers in many of the countries think that their role is teaching fathers how to be better fathers. So they think of themselves as a teacher. In our experience, that doesn't work. Um, if you go to a father and say, I'm here to teach you how to be a better father, the normal reaction is, who do you think you are to come and tell me how to be a father? So shifting social workers to learn how to be a coach or a mentor or problem solving is a lot of the stuff that, that we've seen can be very effective, but it's very hard to do. Um, so, so that's one thing. Um, two quick things that I think were interesting that came out of here. One, again, on the policy thing, I'll give you one example from our work. When we work on Urban 95, so cities, we focus on transport. Why transport, you might ask? Because the reality is most fathers are working. And in many of our cities and countries, those fathers are spending two hours getting to work in the morning and two hours getting home from work at night. By the time they get home, the kids are already asleep. How can we ask a father to be a father, involved father, if they're spending four hours a day in transport? If we can work on transport policy, it sounds like a crazy thing, we can actually help fathers have time to be fathers. So I think it's, we need to think beyond the, the typical things. Maybe one last thing that I really liked that came out here, I heard for the first time, mothers-in-laws and grandparents. A lot of the discussions we've been talking about yesterday in our panels, I think about patriarchy and social norms and culture, we talked a lot about men and women. I think there are some other really important uh, people in the picture that are very strong at reinforcing traditional gender norms. Um, and I think it's really important that we think about how we engage with some of those others as well. Let's open it up for some more questions. Hello, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Awanda Makusha. I'm from the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa. Uh, thank you so much for, for the presentations. I think my, my, my question is general, and I should make a disclaimer before that. Um, it's around uh, pater, uh, patern, uh, paternity leave. Um, so my question is um, that we're looking at, uh, I'll give an example of South Africa and other African countries, uh, including Zimbabwe, and where we've got very huge unemployment rates. And we're talking about paternity leave, which is, uh, to me, is now coming across, and I'm a strong advocate of it, which is coming across now as a more middle class kind of policy. You know? So, in a country like South Africa, where we've got 29% um, of our, our adult population unemployed. What other inter interventions can we look at, other than paternity leave, that affect unemployed fathers to actually say, okay, we need to get these men to be more involved, more secure, and more like um, feeling, feeling good about them being fathers? Thank you. 
Uh, good morning. My name is Meg Green. I am a recent um, recent arrival at Promundo, um, and this is my first men care meeting, and I've really been enjoying um, the discussions very much. I was struck by the question about how to encourage greater engagement of fathers in the lives of young children. It seems to me that all of the father, fatherhood work faces a huge disadvantage because what comes right before, before the embryo implants in the uterus, in that, in the sexual and reproductive health arena, men are completely uh, tangential in many settings. And so then the fatherhood work faces a, a disadvantage because men have not been thinking about their potential for fatherhood and have not been engaged in sexual and reproductive health and rights more fully. So I'm interested to know if um, there are others who have been thinking about this connection and whether there's some work that's going on that links sec men in sexual and reproductive health and rights to their, their engagement in fatherhood. Hello, my name is uh, Sam Wandera. So um, the other question that has always also been coming to my mind, of course, when we talk about parenting, and I've recent, I've been thinking a lot about if you look, if you run away, move away from the mother and, uh, and the father. I don't know, for lack of a better word, we have what we call the maids or the caretakers. It, we are seeing a growing... Uh, arrangement where the mother is busy, the father is busy, but there is this person who is taking care of the children. And they're spending most of the time with the child. I've seen a lot of videos back home in Uganda where we've seen maids mistreating those kids, beating them up. I've seen families that have planted cameras. They come and at some point you see a video clip of a maid treating a child like not a human being. So I was thinking that we also need to think around parenting beyond a mother and a father. Thank you. Maybe one more question. If there's another one out there, then we can take it back to the panel. No. Okay. Going once. Going once, going twice. OK, so panel, we had, I think, three questions. One was. Thinking beyond paternity leave, you know, the, the issue of 30% unemployment in South Africa, I think in many countries, most fathers work in the informal sector. So paternity leave is not even, they're not even eligible, right? So what are other things that we can think about and how important is thinking about father's self-efficacy, which I think is a little bit what, what, what the question was speaking to. I think that would be great. Um, we had a question on... On, on fatherhood and sexual and reproductive health, do we have any examples or do we see any places where that's been included? Um, I know, for example, in Brazil, there's a great initiative in some cities where ANC checkups are not just for women. Uh, dads actually get health checkups where they start to think about are they healthy and ready to become a dad? But that's already after pregnancy starts. So I think your point is about Already, even before that, in family planning programs, in sexual reproductive health programs, do we see fatherhood coming in anywhere there? And then we had a, a, a question of thinking about other caregivers beyond the mother and father or thinking beyond the sort of heteronormative, con you know, the traditional family unit, um, and especially when we think about um, externalized care. So anyone want to take on any of those questions? Um, I, I'll do the first and the third and leave my colleagues to do the second. Um, paternity leave, yes, I, I think um, it's not just the unemployed, it's everyone who isn't employed. Um, and I, I, I never got paternity leave because I was self-employed at the time. Um, I, the, I think, oh, you've asked, what's the alternative? It's really hard. Um, f for me, the essential objective needs to be to establish a relationship between the father and the baby as, as early as possible. That triggers a whole lot of things. It triggers biological reactions. It triggers relationship. Um, 
It triggers aspiration and desire as well. Um, I think that the whole movement of fatherhood in, in, in the world has started when men started being at the birth of their babies and being closer in. It, it makes you want to be more involved. And I think if we could plant that aspiration. Also, think about social media and things. I mean, the, the, you don't have to be, impl you know, everyone's on social media. There's masses on social media, uh, aspirational material, saying, you know, I, I want to be close to my children. And I think that's, a, that's it's not brilliant, but it's, I'm thinking of the alternative, and you asked. Um, regarding the uh, community of care, um, uh, regarding the, the you know, the, I think that the key finding from child development research is that children are brought up in groups and it doesn't really matter who is in the group, okay? There isn't anything essential about one particular parental relationship. There, a, a loving relationship is the, uh, the father-child, mother-child, grandmother-child, grandfather-child relationship, if it's close and loving and interactive, is, rough, is, is not that different what happens. And so, therefore, we don't have to worry too much about who the group is. Yeah. Just we need to work with that group. And that group can include maids. It can include non-familial caregivers. That's the nature of human parenting, that we share it. It's absolutely fundamental. And if we can't work with that, we're not working with human parenting. I'll leave the thing about sexual and reproductive health to one of my esteemed colleagues. Yeah, thank you. Just trying to comment on Meg's question regarding the, on how to link men from ANC through SRH services. Again, building from Rwandan experience. Actually, in Rwanda, it's mandatory for men to accompany their wives for the first ANC visit. So it used to be the practice in Rwanda. And before Men Care Plus started in Rwanda, we've seen that actually men used to go because it was just mandatory not because they used to understand the importance of accompanying their wives and all that. But after the program, we realized that because men were involved from the very beginning, even far before the woman was pregnant, he used now to be involved in the discussion to understand the role and the importance of him being involved in the, in the, the whole process. So as for today, again, from the RST, we've seen that Men now are going with their wives, not because it's mandatory for the, only the first NC, but we've seen that now for those who participate in the program, the couples are nearly reaching the ideal number of visits of NC. Actually, three to four visits to the NC before the wives give, uh, give birth. So just to say that it's really very important to involve men from the very beginning and not just waiting when the woman is pregnant or after she has given birth. Thank you. I'm tackling the sexual and reproductive health um, issue. And it's important for us to go all the way back to school, to adolescent boys, uh, for us to begin to engage them in discussions about sexual and reproductive health. And I'm not talking about teaching it like a subject with an exam <laughs> because that's not how adolescents learn and that's not how we engage adolescents. It's about engaging boys, you know, talking about how they feel and engaging girls talking about how they feel so that both can learn about each other and learn about each other's feelings. So we need to go all the way back when we were talking about sexual and reproductive health. And until we get it right way back, it's going to be very difficult to change it further on. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'll also try to respond to this question on SRHR and um, from our different experiences which we are doing. Um, I think the one element which we have found uh, was productive is from example uh, in Bangladesh and Ghana and even Nigeria as well, that where we try to engage the couples uh, in the discussion around uh, sexual health and around sort of planning about their uh, future or children that way. So that is um, whether they are like, uh, the wife is pregnant and, and husband is there and then we try to engage them or the first time 
mothers or the first time fathers, so getting them engaged in that discussion. That's a one part of element where our work has been very extensive to engage men in, in these discussions around MNCH um, and SRHR issues. The other element is that work which we've done, as I think you've been pointing out, on um, engaging boys and also engaging girls. And, and what we talk about is the champions of change. And this programming um, help address uh, issues not on your gender, but also on sexual reprodu reproductive health. Um, give this information to boys and, and girls and also create space which is interactive and safe to, to reflect upon that and, and, and help them improve their understanding um, on gender issues, on SRHR issues, and have a much more non-violent uh, and much more sort of cooperative uh, personality developments. Okay, um, I think we're almost at the end of our time, unless there's any other burning points from the panel. Um, I know, Duncan, you wanted to quickly talk about the Fatherhood Charter for 30 seconds, and then I'll just make a quick closing remark, and then we will uh, hand over. Yeah, I forgot something in my presentation. I really wanted to say it. Uh, on the thing over there, I put what the Fatherhood Charter. Um, just to tell you what, why we did it and what it is, um, I felt the need to define what the fatherhood issue was globally on the basis of research. To define, because there are so many different interpretations and a lot of nervousness, particularly in, amongst uh, international organisations, about what it is. So I got together all the leading child development experts in the world who studied fatherhood and another 15 or so other people, and we drafted uh, a statement which, in 15 sentences, about what we think the fatherhood agenda is. It took months of negotiation, as you can imagine, um, but it's, the, it's, it's just the first step... I think, in putting fatherhood on the international agenda by saying, this is what we're talking about, this is the kind of thing we want. Thank you. Have a look at it. And it's on the website if you just Google fatherhood charter. Okay. okay. Oh, yep. Yeah, just quickly, 30 seconds. What I just want to highlight this workshop, which we have after the, after the lunch, on uh, the male engagement and father club sort of inter, uh, intervention we've done. There are two points I want to highlight. One is... It is a very interactive and we want to give you a sort of a case study to talk about a gender assessment and come up with a male engagement strategy. And second is, we'll share our chat. So the, um, the, the first one is on uh, the National Fatherhood Report. So with the state of the world's fathers since 2015, um, we've seen certain countries take on the state of Australia's fathers, the state of Russia's fathers, the state of South Africa's fathers, etc. And we wanted an opportunity to compare notes on that kind of research from different settings. So that's what that session will be about. Um, and then, uh, Apta, you want to talk about the um, workshop that you're hosting? Hi, everyone. Um, so we will be having a workshop on the intersections of violence against women and violence against children and the impacts it has on our work with fathers. So we'll be having presentations from UNICEF and Oxfam Morocco about different uh, uh, guidances, best practices, gaps in evidence around the intersections of violence against women, violence against children, and the work on fatherhood, as well as some programs um, on how we've tried to address it. Good morning again. Um, on the fifth floor, small room, we'll be having a conversation about social fatherhood and non-resident fathers. We know it's, been some, it's something that's been happening for a very long time, but not a lot of talk and momentum has been built around that topic. So please be part of some groundbreaking discussions in the room next door, and we have some exciting um, speakers. Available. We're just deciding on the rooms, so oh. we'll tell you in a second about the rooms. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of moving around. So this, this, the last workshop, and I want to go to all of them, um, but the last one that, that is going to be about far-right populism, religious conservatism, and the pushback against women's rights, the points that Daniel was making. So how can we do this fatherhood work? How can we work on masculinities in, in countries, and there are many of them, where there is not only a pushback in terms of kind of progressive policies, but also a pushback on women's rights and gender equality. How do we do this work? And we've got fantastic speakers from Morocco, uh, from the US, from um, Bulgaria, and from the UK. And I know that 
many of the people who are coming to it as well have also got things to say. So, thank you. I was supposed to stand in front and show, say, pick me, pick me. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't help myself, Suleiman. I'm too excited about it. <laughs> They're all going to be really good. Okay, so just to get a sense of the size of rooms that we would need, um, we are going to put that flip chart in the lobby outside of this room. So on your way back from the tea break, please check on the flip chart which room you are going to. So um, on the fatherhood reports, the national state of South Africa, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, just a show of hands. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then the, um, the workshop on violence against children, violence against women, the intersections medium okay the social and non-residential fatherhood as a intersection yeah that's medium and the um, populism etc <laughs> okay it's the most okay thank okay <laughs> There's a populism, et cetera, workshop. Okay, we will put them on the flip chart, please, um, and we will put little arrows and signs on where you should go. Please enjoy your tea break, and the next session starts at 11.30.